salvation and glory. Honor power to the Lord our God. Mm. Good morning. God is The Lord our God is wonderful. Mm. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory. Honor and power to the Lord. Hey, Shawana. Hey, Adora. Hey, Valencia. My. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. Good morning, Vanessa. Hey, Tammy. Yes, he is. My, my, my. Let's release it in the atmosphere. Everybody to Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My God. Salvation. Hey, Brandy. Hey, Vicki Johnson. My God. Hey, Auntie. Yeah. Power. Lord our God. Lord our God is my God. The Lord our God. My God. The Lord our God. One. Where the altos? <laughs> My God. To the King. My God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And the Lord is one. Where the Sopranos? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Good morning. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, 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 thank you. My God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory. My God. Honor and power to Wonderful. My God, thank you, thank you. Wonderful. My God, thank you, thank you, thank you. My God, thank you, Lord. Thank you, 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 thank you. Thank you, 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 thank you. Wonderful. My God. Thank you, Lord. The King of Hey Harlem, New York. And the Lord. Is wonderful. Hey, the best Shannon I know. <laughs> thank you, 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 my God, I love you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. My God. Ah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, 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 thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. My God. Thank you, 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 thank you. Shout to the Lord, shout to the Lord, shout to the Lord, glory to God, 
Shout to the Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. What a mighty God we serve. What a wonderful God we serve. This morning as I was um, getting ready and I have... Uh, <laughs> Ooh, I've literally like been up uh, since like about 1230. Um, the Lord has just been pulling me into a different place of prayer. And so um, <laughs> so I was waiting on y'all like, where they at? 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 Um, um, just um, in the bathroom as I was getting ready and um, the boys will often migrate to my room. Um, when they just want to be close to me, they'll just kind of fall asleep on my floor. Um, they don't care. Um, and so I was trying not to be loud. I was trying not to be loud. And I saw them in my bathroom and I'm getting dressed in my bathroom. And I just, this praise, what, well, this praise was welling up on the inside of me. Like this praise was welling up it was coming up out my belly and i was like my god i just started thanking god for things that i did not even have but when i was thanking him i was thanking him as if i already had them like i was thanking him if things were already manifested the things that i was believing god for like i was thanking him and praising him from the magnitude like it was already done what if we praise god like the healing was there like what if we praise god like everything was manifested had manifested and i was i was like oh my gosh i'm trying not to i'm trying not to wake these boys up i'm trying not to wake them up lord i'm trying to let them get to sleep but just a praise well up on the inside of me for how good God is, and it wasn't just about things. And I'm not talking about like these tangible things. I'm like the things that I know that are supposed to be manifesting, the, the places that I'm supposed to go, the people that I'm supposed to connect to, right? Um, the places the devotional needs to get. I just started thanking Lord. Your promises, your promises, every blessing of yours. I'm thanking him. I'm like, Lord, I thank you. I thank you. You're answering prayers. I thank you, Lord God, that you're opening doors for them. I'm thanking God for your promotion. I'm thanking God for the celebrations. I'm thanking God for the yes. What if we made a decision to praise him, even if it's not answered yet? What if we made a decision to glorify him, even if it hasn't come yet? Like if we just made a decision to trust God, if we just made a decision to be like, you know what, God, it does not. If we made a decision not to sell, can I tell you something? Sometimes we get so settled right? And something will happen for us. And we like, well, God will bless us like with our house. Like we say we were needed housing and God will bless us with our house. And we just be like, oh, I'm so grateful for the house. Well, I need to be thanking him for 10 more houses because I need to be blessing somebody else with the house, right? That, that's got to be the mindset of greatness. That's got to be the mindset of expansion. That's got to be the mindset of increase that I begin to praise him for answering things. So I just begin to thank you. I'm like, my God, thank you for things. Thank you for not me a car, just me a car. Thank you for multiple cars that I can give away, right? Like, thank you. That's what I was like. God, I need cars that I can give away. I need cars that I can bless, bless people with for people who have been just laboring before you and who don't have the resources, right? But, and, and who don't want to be in debt, who can't afford to be in debt, who can't afford to be in a situation of debt, people who need homes and can't afford to be in a situation with debt. Lord God, those were the things. That's the magnitude I, I was thinking this morning. My God, not for myself, not for not for myself, like standing, thanking him for healing to manifest. My God, thanking him. Can you imagine if we begin to praise him like the hospitals are open? Come on, y'all. Come on, come on, y'all. If you begin to praise him like the hospital, there's nobody in the hospital. If instead of murmuring and complaining about COVID, we begin to praise him like COVID is over. Instead of murmuring and complaining about things in our government, if we begin to praise him like the government has changed. 
My God, can you just imagine what that aroma, what that fragrance would smell like? What God, they trust me. That that's a, When you praise God in faith, when you praise God for the impossible, when you praise God for things that have not even manifested yet, that sends a fragrance, that sends a, an aroma, right? That sends an aroma, that's a fragrance that's off. That's something that's manifesting that, um, that he smells. He can smell the fragrance. That's the fragrance. And I'm going to back it up for you in scripture. That's the fragrance of Christ, right? When we walk in faith and we talk in faith and we praise in faith and we make a decision, we're not going to be downtrodden. We're not going to be overwhelmed. We're not going to be consumed. That we begin to thank God for the impossible. Can you imagine that? Like instead of us getting into murmuring and complaining, because I don't know about you. I don't want 11 days turning into 40 years. I don't, I can't afford, I don't want 11 days turning into 40 years. I don't, I don't want that. That's not what I want to see manifest. That's not what I want to see. I need to go on and cross over. I need to get into my promised land. I need to take possession of the things that he told me I can take possession of so that I can go and do what his perfect will in my life. And so I'm like, what if we just put something in the atmosphere? Second Corinthians 2, 14 and 16, the apostle Paul charges Christians to spread the fragrance of the knowledge of Jesus Christ everywhere for we are the aroma of Christ to God amongst those who are being saved and among those who are perishing to one a fragrance from death to death but to the other a fragrance from life to life so what if we set an aroma a fragrance from life to life and step come on my god we glorify you instead of murmuring instead of complaining instead of being caught up in what everybody else is caught up in what if we set an aroma a faith aroma my god right that my a faith a faith aroma a faith aroma just blessing God, just praising him for him being God, praising him, knowing he is sovereign. Yeah, Crystal, I love that part of the scripture from life to life, like from life to life. I don't think we understand, like we grow from glory to glory. And as we grow from glory to glory, and as the glory of God is manifesting in our life, right? It just gets better in heaven. We don't go from life to death. We go from life to, to everlasting life. So what if we just be Begin to act like God was God and praise him despite the circumstances and praise him despite the situation. What if someone sees the life of Jesus Christ in us and experience what? How is it, girl, you got that kind of joy and you're like, my God, this joy that I have. God, this world did not give it to me. This world did not give it to me. This joy that I have comes from Christ Jesus. This joy that I have is because, how, and people will start asking you, how can you trust God when your situation don't even make sense? My God, how can you trust God when it seems like nothing? Can I tell y'all something? I remember one time, I will never, ever, ever, ever forget this. And I've shared a little bit part of this journey. I will never forget this. I remember my husband was so sick. We were on the cardiac floor. Um, they had the heart monitor on him and he was laying in the bed. His feet are swelling. He's got edema. Um, his lungs, he has pulmonary hypertension, right? He has pulmonary hypertension and he's laying in the bed. And then he hears the spirit of the Lord tell him, get up. And he gets up out the bed and he begins to walk the hospital. Now he's in the hospital. He needs care, right? And he gets up and he's walking the hospital and he's praising God and he's laying his hands on each door that he passes. Man, he's laying his hands on each door. Each door he passes, he's laying his hands, he's praying. And then I remember the next morning, not considering himself, not considering his situation, not considering, can I tell you something? We had just got a diagnosis that they, in which they said that there was nothing else that they could do. Baby, did you hear me? This We had just got a diagnosis in which they said there was nothing. Mr. Johnson, Mrs. Johnson, there's nothing else we can really do for me. We had just got a diagnosis that there was nothing else they can do for him. And he got up his bed, out of his bed, and he began to take position. And he began to anoint the doors. And he began to, like, did y'all hear me? <laughs> did y'all hear what I said? We had just got a 
diagnosis saying there's nothing else we could do. And this man stood up in faith and said, well, either I get my healing on this side or I get my healing on the other side. Either way, I'm going to be healed. So until then, I have work to do. And he got up and he began to pray. And he was like, Lord, what are we doing? And the Lord said, you'll see. You Come on now. He said, you'll see. Just trust me. You'll see. And so he's praising God and he's thanking God and he's worshiping in the hallways. And I think he led two different people to Christ, but he's sitting there. So the next morning, the nurse came in and she was just kind of shaking her head. She's shaking her like she's shaking her head. She's like, what's going on? She's like shaking her head. And, the, and he was like she was like I can't believe this and he said what can't you believe she said that now they're on the cardiac floor she said this morning 70 percent 70 percent of the floor went home 70 percent 70 70 percent of the floor went home she said we ain't never seen nothing like this we ain't never we ain't never seen a situation occur like this we ain't never seen this many discharges in one day but just just a fragrance just a praise just taking himself in a position of worship just taking himself to not consider his situations just taking himself to not be overwhelmed and consumed by what he see she said we ain't never we ain't never seen nothing like this we ain't never seen nothing happen like this that the floor wiped out like this that is the, that's, I, see, I got to, can I tell y'all something? And we're going to get into words. See, I got too many instances. I got too many moments. I was talking to Josiah yesterday and we were just, we've been standing in faith for something. And he said, uh, he said, mama, I got too much evidence. He said, I got too much. Now his little bitty 16 year old self, he said, mama, I got too much evidence evidence that God is God. He said, I see, I done seen his hand too much. I didn't experienced him too much. He said, I got too much evidence that God is God. And so I'm telling you, I got too much evidence. God is God. I just got too, I got way too much evidence that God is God. So when I praise him, it's because I got too much evidence that God is still God. I got too much evidence that God is faithful. I got too, I got too much evidence. And somebody will come back and say, but Lakeisha, your husband's story ended in death. No, my husband went from life to life. No, my husband, see, I can't, my husband went from life, my husband went from life to life. Like everybody be like, oh no, he died. No, he didn't die due to the complications of sickle cell. And I tell people that all the time. I tell them that in the hospital, that ain't his story. He didn't go from, he didn't go from life to death. No, my husband went to life from life to life. He got a whole new body. He got a brand new perspective. My God, my God. God, my God, my, no, he went from life to life. He didn't, I got too much evidence. I got too much evidence. And so when I praise God, when, that's why I said death, you gotta, the devil, the devil, the devil only likes to plague you in your mind with things that, that he knows you have yet to trust God with, right? That's the thing. And so we had took a position and made a decision that death was no bad thing. I'm just being real. It just, it's just real. We had took a position and made a decision that death was no bad thing. Like that was our position. The, the, the thing had become when the enemy was presenting or saying to us and the doctors were saying, this is all we can do. And this is all that. No, we took our position. You don't have authority over this. And I t can I just tell you that part of my story? When we were in the emergency room and they were giving him medicine to get out of pain and he was still he was still talking psalms 91 out of his mouth he was still and the nurse was like well if i give him this last shot it could potentially put him in a place where he leaves here and i said to her i said ma'am you can't take authority over this ma'am if he leaves here i've seen him in this position before ma'am if he goes you will not get the glory from this if he goes you will not this ain't got nothing to do with your medicine this ain't got nothing to do with it. This has only to do with his God. 
This has only to do with his God because my husband had already made the decision. He told me, he said, baby, I'm really ready to go home. I'm tired. I fought long. I fought brave. He, he, said, he made the decision. So you're not going to get the glory out of this. You're not going to get the glory out of his story. You're not, you're not get modern medicine, medicine period, can't get the glory out of this story, right? Why? Because it was God's journey to begin with. So I have way too much evidence that God is still God. I have way too much evidence that God is still God. I have way too much evidence, right? I have way too much evidence that God is still God. He is still, he is still, still God. He is still God. He is so faithful. He is so good. He is wonderful. He is counselor. He is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is the great I am. He is the prince of peace. He is Adonai. He is my joy. He is my strength. My God. See, you got to get the position. You got to change the position. You got to take, you got to take the authority from the devil. He always thinks he has authority over you when you don't know what the word says. So when he was slinging it at me, I said, no, let me tell you, it's, it's better. It's so much better to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So if you think you're going to consume me with his death, no, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Yeah, Teresa's death, where is your sting? He's going to get his glorified body. That's why we have to cast down the thoughts, cast down the wicked imaginations, cast down the things that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. He, Think about it. My God, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me slow down. Y'all done got me excited. He only comes for what he thinks you don't know. He only comes for what he thinks you don't have a resolve in. He knows what you have knowledge of because the patterns that you operate in, the patterns that you operate in prove evidence to him of what you trust and believe. Jesus, the, the patterns that you operate in are that because that's the devil. He's like that. He's roaring. He's prowling. He's looking. He's discovering you. He watches you. So your patterns of behavior are okay. my God. So if you got trust issues, when you got trust issues, he know what you got trust issues. He know where you got trust issues, where your health is concerned. He know where you got trust issues, where your relationship is concerned. He know you where you got trust issues, where your money is concerned. He knows absolutely every place in which you have trust issues. He is looking at your patterns of behaviors. He is look. Yeah, you got Matt. You got to switch it up. You got to change. You got to get a fresh perspective. That's why Romans was like. That's why he said to us in Romans, you got to renew your mind, right? Because we are such creatures of habits and patterns. Some of us been praying the same way since the second, third, and fourth grade, and God is trying to give you fresh revelation, and God is trying to give you fresh fire, and God is. Trying Trying to give you a fresh anointing that pulls down strongholds and pulls down wicked imaginations. My God, somebody say, I need a fresh, I need a fresh, I need a new, new, right? And we all know I've always done things this way. Well, if you always do things this way and it's not producing a desired result, you may, you may need to get up and do it. When the Lord started pushing me out the bed at midnight, I was like, what are we doing? What are we doing? I just went to bed at nine o'clock. He started pushing me out the bed. Admit, girl, get up. Girl, go on and study. Girl, go on and pray. Girl, go on and move. He needed me to switch things up because he already knew where the adversary was trying to encroach, what he was trying to do. He knew the strategies against you. He knew the strategies against this devil, then this devotion. He was like, nah, we about to switch it up. We about to change the game. That's why we got to be led by him. That's why we got to be seated at his feet. My God, we can't make commitment to him and be like, oh my gosh, Lord, you know, use me. You, If you're going to ask him to use you, it's not going to look like the way, it's not going to look the way you want it to look. It's not going to look, it's not going to look and feel comfortable to you. It's going to be all outside the box. <laughs> it's going to be all, it's going to be all outside the box because that's the kind of God we serve. My God, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Holy Spirit, go before me. Open our ears to hear 
Give us eyes to see. Remove the scales off our eyes. Lord God, we thank you, Lord God, um, for the hope and call of who you called us to be in Christ Jesus. So let me give you just a little bit more of this because I already really actually the Holy Spirit led us right in there. I want to talk to you because we're still talking about the good shepherd. We're still talking about how the Lord leads us. We're still talking about how the Lord guides us, right? We still, we're still talking about how to be in this level of relationship with God. So today I want to talk to you about fiery darts. I want to talk to you about fiery darts. I want to talk to you about being put in uncomfortable situations. I want to talk to you about how we demolish, destroy, and cast down. I want to talk to you a little bit about what was going on with Paul in this scripture so that you can take this word and apply it to yourself and use it for victory. I'm not going to throw nothing this morning. I'm not going to throw nothing this morning. I promise I'm not. I want you to I want you to have this so that you can use this for victory. See, every time we get word, every time we get revelation in the word, it's supposed to be for us for victory. It's not supposed to be just like, oh, girl, that was a good word from the Lord. No, this is my sword. When you get a word from the Lord, this is my sword. This is my tool. How do I use this word, this sword, this tool in my life so that it changes everything? I don't, I, everything that I'm connected to, I don't know about you, but I don't want to pray not a nan another prayer. I don't want to pray not a nan another prayer that don't get answered. I don't want to pray because he already told me if you believe you receive when you pray. So I need to pray prayers. I need to understand what he's saying to me, right? So Romans has already said to us, I need you to do not be conformed to this world right? We need to renew our minds in the word of God. We've already been establishing that fact. When we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, right? When you said we're full of the Holy Spirit, right? Um, you can ask to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then once we're full of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will start leading us into the direction in which God needs us to go. Many of us, I talked about this a little bit, have soul hurts, the damage, the hurt, the problems, the issues we have in our soul, the lack of knowledge, um, the lack of wisdom, the lack of word in us. I feel God is about to shift us. I feel like this word today is about to shift us. The lack of knowledge in us is what keeps us from walking in victory. See, most of us think we're so incomplete. We don't know that the work that God has already completed us, right? We're sealed to the day of redemption. And when we're sealed to the day of redemption, we're already full up, filled up. We're already filled up. And so the word activates the filling, the, act, the, the growth. The seed is in there. It's planted. The word is activating it. The Holy Spirit is leading us in the direction so that we can obtain and gain the knowledge and the wisdom and our mind can be renewed and we can begin to act like Christ and we can begin to act like Christ. So let's go over to second Corinthians 10 and the 10th and the fifth verse. And I'm reading to you in the amplified. And so when I read it to you in the amplified, I'm going to give you the other words that the version says, it says, we are destroying, <laughs> right? Some, some, some versions say we demolish, right? Some versions say we cast down. Some versions say we are, um, we, we annihilate, right? We're dealing with this. So we are destroying sophisticated arguments and every <laughs> exalted and proud thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought and purpose captive to the obedience of Christ. We're not just taking our thoughts captive. We're taking our purpose as well. So when we demolish, we destroy what we're saying, cast down. What we're saying is obstacles. Everything that's raised up, everything that's raised up, the second Corinthians 10 and five, everything that's raised up, every thought that's raised up. See, that that's raised up. We're destroying it, demolishing it. We're separating it from us. My God, come on, teach this Holy Spirit. We're separating it from us. That is what we're doing. So when we say we destroy the thoughts, right? We're destroying the knowledge. What we're doing is we're separating it from us. We're ruining the plan of the enemy against our life. We're annihilating his plan. We're annihilating his tactics, right? So, so we have to take hold of this, but I'm gonna back, I'm gonna back it up because I need you to see this. This is what you need to know was happening with them right here. Paul was in a situation in which he was preaching to the church of Corinth. And as he was preaching to the church of Corinth, what was going on was they weren't receiving what Paul was saying. They weren't. They weren't receiving what Paul was saying. Um, as a matter of fact, they were challenging. They were like, he writes all these 
these meaty, meaty letters. And then when you meet him in person, he's all mild and meek. <laughs> they were um, talking about Paul and dogging Paul out really for being humble, right? They were just trying to stir up some mess. And so Paul was... Con Paul was cautioning the disciples and cautioning his believers. And I'm going to back up to the fourth verse in just a second. Don't get sidetracked with this mess. That's what he was basically saying to them. I'm putting it in modern day vernacular. Don't get sidetracked with this mess. Don't get... Don't be getting overwhelmed with what they say. Don't do this. Don't, I'm telling you, don't, don't do this. Don't get pulled into your flesh because if you get pulled into your flesh, you're going to get sidetracked. That's what he's saying to him. He says, don't, don't get caught up in this mess. Don't get caught up in what they're doing. Don't get caught up in what they're saying. Don't, don't get, yeah, come on now. Stay focused. He said this, because this is, this is a trick. This is, this is a trap, right? This, and that's what he told him. Back it up to the third verse. It says, for though we walk in the flesh as mortal men, we are not carrying on our spiritual warfare according to the flesh and using the weapons of man. We're not, we're not carrying. We cannot afford to fight on the same level as man. We cannot afford to fight. There's a better weapon that you have that's going to yield a different result. There's a better weapon that you have that's going to yield a result, right? So if you you sow petty, right? Whatever a man sows, he's going to reap. We, we sow to the flesh, we're going to reap from the flesh. If I sow, if you petty and I sow petty, or if the enemy is being petty through someone, guess what I'm going to turn around and reap? I'm going to reap pettiness again. If you're angry and I sow anger, then guess what's going to turn around again? I'm going to reap anger again, right? So that's what that's what Paul is saying to us. Paul is like, don't get caught up in all this craziness and all this other mess that they got going on. On the contrary, we're going to do something different, right? His opponents were challenging his ministry. The enemy is challenging your ministry. The enemy is challenging your purpose. The enemy is challenging your marriage. The enemy is challenging your family. The enemy is challenging your finances. The enemy is challenging your health. That is how he does. That is how he does. He's only being him. <laughs> He's only being him. And that's the thing. He only is doing his job. He's only doing him. He's only doing what he is set assigned to do on earth. So it says, for though we walk in the flesh as mortal men, we are not carrying on our spiritual warfare according to the flesh and using the weapons of man. Now, the fourth verse, it says the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood are not physical weapons. Our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Well, if the word says that this is what our weapons do, why would we use anything else? This is training ground. This is where we have to spend time training because if our thinking, our thoughts have been this way for a long time, then we have to get aggressive in the word of God. So I want, to, and we can't afford to play patty cake. This is not nursery rhymes. This is not me mimicking and just saying something, right? No, we've got to, we've got to get aggressive in the word of God. Paul said, what he was really saying to them is you really got to destroy it at the onset. You got to just the minute the thought and it does not. And see, this is the mistake we made. I'm not just talking about our thoughts in my mind. I'm also talking, talking about the thoughts that other people try to push on us that do not align with kingdom. The thoughts that other people try to push on us that do not align with heaven. Right. This ain't no we can't no patty cake. This ain't no gentle. This ain't no nursery rhyme. This is I cannot afford to play with this. I am going to have to get aggressive in the word of God. God, if I want my thoughts to change and if I want to be able to rebuke thoughts that do not come from you, or if not, what happens is I will begin to mirror what I see in the world, not of the world, in the world, not of the world. If not, I will begin to mirror what I see. I will begin to act just like the world because I think that there's a victory in that. I think that there's a win-win situation in that. No, Paul said, we're going to have to destroy this on onset. And so as he's dealing with the criticism of the church of Corinth, right? They were saying this, like I told you, they were saying his letters are powerful. They was really kind of calling him weak, right? Paul was saying, I need you to sober up. 
I we just no no play play no play in this time. He said, I need you to sober up, right? I don't need you to entertain this way of thinking. I need I need you. So when he comes back up to the fourth verse, because we read the fifth verse, and he says, the weapons of our warfare are not physical. Don't get on their level. <laughs> Do not get on their level. Do not act like they act. Do not think like they think. Do not sound like they sound. Do not, do not do that. I need you to sober up, right? So the weapons that we fight for, fight with, are not the weapons of the world. So when thoughts, when fiery thoughts, thoughts of of injustice and fiery thoughts come against my self-esteem, think, think self-esteem, and those things don't line up with the word of God. I have to demolish and destroy them quickly. Well, the only way I'm going to recognize that those don't belong to the word of God is I have to know what the word says about me. I have to be firm in what the word says about me. I have to understand that I have the divine power to demolish strongholds. Right? Strongholds are what securely fastens itself to us. That's what a stronghold is. It becomes a part of us um, as if it's normal, as if it's a part of our lifestyle. It's in our speech. It's in our thinking. It's in our patterns and our habits of how we handle money. It's in our patterns and habits of how we handle relationships. Strongholds fasten themselves to you and they look very normal. The only reason, the only way you're going to be able to recognize is a, it's a stronghold is that you spend more time in the word of God. So Paul is like, look, we're not going to, we're not going to fight with our fleshly bodies. Those fade away. Second Corinthians 4, 16. That's what he said. He said, I'm not going to fly. We're not going to fight with our fleshly bodies. Our fleshly bodies will fade away. We're not going to fight, fight with this, this world. Mm, we can't fight with that. That all is going to fade away. Right. And he said, so you're going to have to fight with something greater than you. You're going to have to fight. And so when he comes to them in the fifth, fifth verse and he says, we're going to cast down wicked imaginations. We're going to cast down anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Then when the enemy is hitting me with the fiery darts, I've got to fight with a different weapon. I can't fight with pettiness. First Peter five and eight says, be sober, be vigilant, right? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, as not a lion, as looks like is not a lion as looks like he has authority in your life. Looks like he has authority in your finances. Looks like he has authority in your marriage. Looks like he has authority over your kids, but greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He says he, he's, he's, he's running around, walking around, looking to see who he can devour. So I want to go back over when he, when we talk about destroying, pulling down, when we go over to Ephesians six and we start thinking when, when Paul says to us about the fiery darts, take up the shield of faith so that you can extinguish the fiery darts. Fiery darts are those thoughts that spread like wildfire. Whoo, my God, fiery darts are those thoughts. He tells us above all, take the shit of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. When we talk about fiery darts, we are talking about those thoughts that enter your head, my God, and seem to take over. Those thoughts that enter your head and seem to take over. You could be in a conversation. I, I was in a conversation with somebody the other day and they text me and they ask me for someone's number. And I simply said, let me see if I can get in touch with the person. Those were my only words. They text back and said, so you don't want to give me the number. I text back and said, that is not what I said. They text back and said, that's exactly what you said. That is not what I said. I said, let me get in touch with the person because it was not, it was not it, it was not, I'm not giving your number out unless you give me permission. So it was not my place to give out your telephone number until they had an interpreted a whole different conversation. That's the fiery darts. That conversation was going into a whole different level, a whole different place. A whole, it was beginning to spread like wildfire. It was beginning to move. So think about those thoughts that we have that just seem to take off in our head. So somebody's not even thinking about us and we see somebody looking across the room and we like, what are they staring? What are they staring at me for? What are they saying? They're not even staring at you. They lost in their own thoughts. It's the thoughts in which we lose ourselves. It's the ways in which we overthink. The enemy can come to us and say, okay, you got a diagnosis. 
This is what I'm seeing. It's those thoughts when we get the diagnosis and then we let the thought, the diagnosis keep going on in our head. We done already wrote our funeral. Uh, let me get the funeral plan. Uh, let me go get this written down. We didn't, we didn't already wrote our funeral. Those are the thoughts that spread like wildfire, right? That's the thoughts. Those are the things. Because remember, again, the enemy knows our patterns. He's watched our cycles. He's watched if we're insecure. He's watched if we're jealous. He's watched. He knows when you celebrate somebody. He knows when you celebrate somebody, when you're not celebrating somebody, when somebody is being blessed and you acting like a hater. He watches every last one of our patterns, right? And so these fiery thoughts, fiery, on fire, thoughts that consume our thinking, thoughts that do not line up with God, what God said, Thoughts of rejection, thoughts of depression, those thoughts. So that's why Paul is like, no, we have to cast these down. That's why Ephesians 6 and 16, he says, tell us above all, take the shield of faith where ye, we, ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, right? He says, come back. He says, I need you to deal with the thoughts of man. I need you to deal with the thoughts of the enemy. And I'm going to have to have you. Well, the only way that you're going to be able to deal with those thoughts is that you're full of the word of God. You cannot, you cannot be casual with the word of God because that's where you get your faith from. That's where you get your knowledge from. That's where you get revelation um, from and deciding whether or not is this a thought of Jesus Christ? Is this a thought of Jesus Christ? Is this what Jesus thinks about me? Is this what Jesus says about me? Is this how Jesus treats me? If Jesus don't treat me this way, why am I allowing somebody else to treat me this way? Right? Why am I allowing this in my space? Why am I, even thoughts towards others, towards us? Why would I sit and allow somebody to berate me or talk ugly to me or what? No, humble myself, love, remove myself from this conversation until you know how to talk to me like my God talks to me. My God, until you know how to talk to me like my God. So if I'm going to deal with the fiery thoughts, not just my own fiery thoughts, but the fiery thoughts of other, I'm going to have to deal with them with the word of God. I'm going to have to cast down the wicked imaginations. I'm going to have to deal with the strongholds. I'm going to have to annihilate them and deal with them quickly. And the only way that I'm going to deal with them is through faith. Go back to Ephesians 6, 16. It tells us above all, take the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Let me give you this last little bit of scripture. So I'm tying this all in. This is why we have to know God is the good shepherd. Did y'all hear me? This is why we have to know him as the shepherd because his word will lead us in the right direction. His word builds faith in us. So let me go over to Hebrews 11. It says, now faith is the assurance, right? Faith is the insurance. So if the fiery darts, and I love this because Ephesians 6 and 16 is a part of us putting on our armor. So it has to be something significant when we get here. And he says, but above all, Above all, he says, but above all, but above all, you need to take on this shield of faith. That's what he said. He said, but above all, he said, the sword of the spirit, he said, he said, but above all, you need to pick up this shield of faith. And here's why you need the shield of faith. He said, then you're going to be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. When I put on my field of shield of faith, it does something significant. Hebrews 11 and one, it says, now faith is the assurance, the title deed of confirmation of things hoped for divinely guaranteed <laughs> my god that, that this is it the faith this is the this is it the faith even if i don't get it even if i don't understand it but the word says it lord i'm going to trust you i might not get it i may not understand this direction you're leaving in i not i may not understand why you're saying that this is best for my life but i'm going to take my hope and my trust Faith is the assurance. It's your title deed. It's your confirmation of things hoped for divinely guaranteed. So let's go back to all the things that Jesus has said real quick. If Jesus said that I am healed, um, Isaiah 53 and 5 tells us,
us, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, chastised for our peace. And by his stripes, I am healed, right? If I am healed, then my faith in that word gives me the title deed, the confirmation of things hoped for, divinely guaranteed. In Matthew 6, if he tells me, this is Jesus talking, because the end of the scripture in the first Corinthians, um, second Corinthians 10 and 5, he said, we really, he said, we need to take on the thoughts of Christ. We need to think like Christ thinks, right? So then my faith, my di my divine guarantee is in what the word says to me about me and nothing else and nothing else. What is the word saying to me? Not nothing, else, what nothing, else, nothing else said, right? So then when the world, when the world starts talking to me, like when the world starts talking to me or when my situation or circumstance starts talking to me, um, and it looks like I'm not going to be provided for my title deed, my divine guarantee. If I switch over to Matthew six says, God says, do not worry about what you eat. Do not worry about what you wear. Are you not more than the, the sparrows? Are you not more than the bird? Are you not better than the flower? I'm going to take care of that. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. So if my mindset is going to cast down the thought, so I'm not worried about food. So I'm not worried um, about what I eat. So I don't worry about what I fit where my divine guarantee is in the word of God. No, no. The evidence of things not seen. I may not see it, but the conviction of their reality Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by physical sense. Let me say this again. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by physical senses. <laughs> Fifth senses. That's what faith does. So by faith, for the kind of faith, listen to this part, for by this kind of faith, the men of old gained divine approval by, by faith that is with an inherited trust and enduring confidence in the power, wisdom, and goodness of God. So I don't get my power. I don't get my wisdom and anything else other than God. I don't get my identity and anything else other than Christ. I don't get my provision and anything else other than God, I'm sticking and staying with the, what this word said. I'm casting down them thoughts. So anytime the enemy starts speaking to me about what I lack, I fill myself up with faith in the word of God because that's what's going to cancel him. He cannot stand against the word of God. It says, so by faith, faith, it is with an inherited trust and enduring confidence in the power, wisdom, and goodness of God. We understand that the worlds were framed and created and formed and put in order and equipped for their intended purpose. The same is for you by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. And if you go read that whole rest of the 11 three, it's going to tell you all the things that were achieved by faith. It's going to tell you all the things that was achieved by faith. Abel, but what Abel achieved, what Enoch achieved, what Abraham achieved. It's going to go back and tell you all the things that were achieved, not by doing, but by faith. By taking control over the wicked imagination, by taking control of the fiery darts, by not allowing your man. That's why whatever come out your mouth is important. Your words frame your life. My God, that's it. I got to go. Your words frame your life. Your words frame your life. That's why we don't do it. I don't believe when people be like, oh, I was just joking. Ain't no just joking. Your words frame my life. If you got your partner letter, I talked about the overuse of emojis. Your words frame your life. Your words frame your life. You are as you are made just like God. He said, I made man in my image. My words that I think and the words that I say frame my life. It frames my life. It transitions my life. Even if I don't understand that, then I've got to get my words. I've got to get his word deep in my heart. So that word is the word that begins to frame my life. And I'm going to have to do that by faith. And I'm not, I'm going to have to make this more than just religion, more than just church and make this a lifestyle and make this a lifestyle. I got to do it. That's, that's the transition. That's the freedom. That's the strategy. That's the difference. 
That's, that's, that's what's going to determine whether you go from glory to glory. That's what's going to determine. That is deep, Minister Boy. That's deep. That's what's going to determine how you change the course and the trajectory of who you are. It's a lifestyle. It is not mimicking. It is not parroting. It is a lifestyle. It is a lifestyle difference. It's a lifestyle change. It's way deeper than religion. It's way deeper than you thought. So when the thoughts, if my thoughts, and remember strongholds are things that have fastened themselves to us. So when we've been in a stronghold, even a stronghold process in our mind, if we've been a worrier, if we've been weary, um, if we've been um, suspicious, if all of those things that have been going on in our mind, if we've been condescending, if we have a critical mindset, whatever those things are, We've got to renew my mind in the word so that I begin to recognize what's the wrong type of thinking. Because whatever the wrong type of thinking is, is also what I'm saying out my mouth, which is changing the trajectory of my life. Even though God had told me already that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And, all, and, and even though God told me that as my soul was prospering, I should be prospering, right? But I'm not prospering. Then perhaps my soul isn't prospering. Because I'm being transformed by the words that come out my mouth. Because these are the thoughts that I think on. That's it. That's it. I think that's enough for us to chew on. Man, that was meaty. That, that was meaty. That was a strategy. So I got to get in the word so I can find out what, what thoughts don't even belong to me. I got to get in the word so that I can find out what's not even a part of my character. I got to get in the word so I can find out how I'm supposed to live and not be bombarded with the fiery darts. Because what I need is in faith, not, not in anything else. Else. Yeah, not in anything else. Not not in anything else. Father God, I thank you. Father God, I bless you for your word today. I thank you for each and every devotional person on this devotional. I thank you for your glory. I thank you for a shift in the atmosphere. I thank you, Father God, for a change. I thank you, Father God, you are bringing us keeping us from danger, seen and unseen, and you are bringing us into new levels and new places. I thank you that this word is planted so deep in our spirit, Father God, that we'll begin to long and thirst for you, Lord God, that we'll pick up our shield of faith, Lord God, above all my God, that we'll divide, dive ourselves in the word, that we'll study to show ourselves approved. Father God, give us revelation of who you are in our life. Reframe our thinking. Retrain us, Holy Spirit, so we can be sober, so we can be vigilant, Lord God. My God, bind our mind to the mind of Christ and bind our will to the will of God. Now, Father God, get your glory out of our life today. Get, get your glory out of our life today and show us your glory and let us manifest your glory in Jesus name. Amen. Can I just, can I do one thing? Can I do one thing before we go? And I'm out of here. I promise I am. I'm supposed to be gone. Can I just do one thing before we go? Let me do just this one thing. I want to confess over your finances. And when I say confess, I'm not talking about magic, right? I'm not talking about magic. I meant to do this in the beginning, but the Holy Spirit took over. I don't, I don't, I'm not talking about magic. When we do financial confessions, what we're doing is asking father, let our finances line up with what you you have said about finances because most of us don't know kingdom finances anyway, right? The scripture tells us um, when the scripture talks about debt and it says we are a slave to the, bar, the lender, right? When we take on debt, we become a slave to the lender. So most of us don't have kingdom mindsets where finances are concerned, right? We don't understand it's God that gives us the power to get wealth. If we knew that it was God that gave us the power to get wealth, we wouldn't be overworked. So when we do a financial confession, what we're saying is, Lord, I need my life to line up with what your will is. I need my life to line up with your kingdom. And it begins to renew something in our mind. So I just want to confess this over our finances today. It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. My God, Jesus has delivered us from poverty and giving us wealth. God is able to make all grace, every favor and earthly blessing come to us in abundance so that we may always and under all circumstance and whatever the need be self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid or support and furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. 
thus I will be enriched in all things and in every way so that I can be generous and general and my generosity as it is administered will bring forth thanksgiving to God. When I am generous, it's going to bring forth thanksgiving to God. Say, I cannot be stingy and live kingdom. I cannot begin. Remember the same measure you give is the same measure you're going to give back, right? He says, I have given and is given to me good measure, pressed down, shaken together, runneth over. Men give to me all the time. I do not, that's your promotion, that's your increase. I do not lack any good thing for my God supplies all of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. This confession, Galatians 3, 13 and 14, Deuteronomy 28, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, um, 2 Corinthians 9 and 8, in the Amplified, Luke 6 and 38, and Philippians 4 and 19. That was all scripture, just kind of left on. So when you begin to confess stuff like that, God will put you in a new mindset of kingdom finances. Sometimes, a lot of times, our problems with our finances have to do with a heart issue of how we feel towards money and how we make money a God or whether or not we walk in a poverty mindset. So when we pray a financial confession, we're asking the Lord, show us how to line our finances up with kingdom finances so that you can get more glory out of our finances. We do not want to be limited by this world system. And then when you have been not practiced good stewardship, ask the Lord, show me how how to be a better steward over what you give me because it all belongs to you anyway. And guess what he'll start doing? He'll start showing you how to rearrange your finances. He'll send you to a finance class. He'll show you what kingdom giving is. He'll, he'll teach you all that. Why? Because that's the kind of God we serve. Hey, if there's anybody on here that has not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, this is your opportunity. Don't wait. Don't wait. Make this the moment and be like, you know what? This is the moment that I need to accept Jesus. And all I have to simply say is this. I need to acknowledge that I am a sinner. My God. Father God, please forgive me for my sins. And then I need to believe he died on the cross for me. Jesus Christ, I know you died on for my sin, for my sins. And then I need to confess it with my mouth. And I need you to be Lord and Savior over my life. If you just made that confession, I need you to do me a favor. Send me an email, info at justbeinglmj.com. And let me disciple you. Let me send you some materials. Stay connected to this devotional. Now, my last thing is, I need you to consider to partner with this ministry. I need you to consider partnership with this ministry. I need you. I need you. Pray. Don't say, mm-mm. Ask the Lord, Lord, do you want me to partner with this ministry? And whatever he tells you to do, go to the website, click the donate button, boop, give there, or you can cash app us, dollar sign, LMJ ministry. I love you so much. And you can go to the website and find out all the things that we do, all the ways we serve our community. You can find out about Feed the Streets. You can find out about Drew Projects. You can find out all the ways that we give to the poor. Everything we do is on our website. I love you so much more than anything. God loves you. I'm on fire for this word today. Renew, renew. I don't even feel like I've been up. <laughs> renew your mind in the word so you can walk out the kingdom daily. I love you so much more than anything. God loves you. Go be loved today. Let somebody else experience the love of God through you. I'll see y'all back in the morning, 5 a.m. Bring somebody in. Tell somebody, you know what? I want you to be a part of this devotional. I want you to be a part. We're just a community of believers falling in love with Jesus. <laughs> We're just a community of believers falling in love.